Protective coatings for bridge preservation. Polyaspiric coatings for reducing bridge maintenance painting costs, a case study in Virginia. Mark Hudson and Aaron Olson. Quickly, just as a show of hands, how many of you represent the DOT or Bridge Owning Authority? And how many of you have ever heard of polyaspartic coatings? Okay. Well, first I wanted to acknowledge there's several other folks that help, help put this work together. Uh, a colleague of mine at Cavestro, Todd Williams, as well as uh, Wayne Fleming from the Virginia Department of Transportation. Um, we originally presented this back in 2016 at the SSPC conference and has then also been published in the Journal Protective Coatings and Linings as well back in 2016. So only a few uh, topics on the agenda today. First, I'll uh, cover the first half, giving an overview of uh, polyaspartic coatings, what they are, where they've been used, and their um, uh, advantages for bridge maintenance painting. And then Mark will step in and talk a little bit about um, how Virginia's used these coatings for the last uh, 10 or so years, as well as some additional projects done by several other DOTs more recently. So if we think back, you know, how have we protected steel bridges for, you know, since they've been built, right? We had a long-standing history of using oil-based uh, coatings with lead and chromium pigments that really worked quite fantastically. Unfortunately, once the health effects of uh, lead came to light, really those sort of ceased to exist. And the DOTs turned to using zinc-based coatings for galvanic protection of steel back in the 1960s. Shortly after, vinyl coatings were then being applied over the zinc-based pro uh, zinc products for about 20 years. And again, those coating systems worked fantastically. Again, the problem became that those vinyl coatings have lots of vol volatile organic uh, content. You know, and so as the EPA and other regulatory bodies began to regulate that level of down, right, really, really was the nail in the coffin for vinyl coatings, at least in the bridge business. So that was somewhere in the early 1990s where then the, the industry transitioned over using a, a three-coat system of a zinc-rich primer, whether that's organic or inorganic, um, an epoxy intermediate coat, and then finished with the polyurethane top coat. And again, that's still the, the, the system of choice today for steel bridges by a, a vast majority of the DOTs. Back in the early 2000s, two-coat systems with polyaspartic urethane coatings really started to find their way into the market, and that'll be the the topic of the discussion today. So what are these polyaspartic coatings? Well, they're very similar to standard polyurethanes in many ways. Both of those polyurethanes and polyaspartic coatings are two component systems where you've got an A side and B side, B side that are mixed right uh, before application. Now what really differentiates them there is on the A side of these materials, a polyurethane, you've got a hydroxyl bearing polyol which is either acrylic or polyester based and that reacts with the B side which is a polyisocyanate or catalyst or hardener however you want to refer to it and that reaction results in your polyurethane coating. For polyaspartic again you have two components but the A side here instead of a polyol you've got a polyaspartic resin which is actually a mean functional. That reacts with the polyisocyanate or your, your catalyst and that gives you your polyaspartic coating. So here you got more of a polyurea based chemistry rather than a polyurethane. The other key raw material differences here between the, for the polyurethane to get this A side to react with the B side in really any meaningful amount of time, um, you need to add a catalyst. Typically that's tin based. And what that tin catalyst does is not only catalyze the reaction between these two components, but it also catalyzes the reaction between the B component and moisture. So when polyurethanes are applied at high humidities, especially if they're over applied above the manufacturer's recommended uh, film thicknesses, What's going to happen is that isocyanate is going to react with moisture and that reaction leads to carbon dioxide gas. And then now you've got excessive film thickness, all the CO2 gas being generated, which isn't really easily escaped from the film. And then you start to see things like bubbling, blistering, and downglossing with the polyurethane coatings. So with the polyaspartic systems, you don't need that tin catalyst for that reaction to take place. That amine wants to readily react with that isocyanate. And the kinetics of that are far greater than with that isocyanate to react with moisture by itself. So that really allows for much higher film builds to be applied with this poly <clears throat> with the polyaspartic coating rather than the polyurethane. So if you look on the left here, I'll try not to favor one side. On the left, you've got traditional three coat systems, zinc epoxy urethane. Again, as I said, pretty much industry standard for heavy duty corrosion protection of steel, especially on bridges. 
decades of performance. So moving to a two-coat system, basically what we're doing is replacing the epoxy and the polyurethane with a high film build polyaspartic top coat. So basically you're combining the benefits that you're getting from both of those layers into one. So you're getting the same film thickness that you would be with the standard three-coat system, and you're getting the same UV resistance that you would expect from your polyurethane, but all with one less coat of paint. So that really leads to a lot of cost savings through labor reduction and, and just improvements in the efficiency of being able to paint faster. And now that these systems have been used for about 15 years, we're starting to see some very good field performance in comparison to the three-coat system. So if you look at a lot of other market applications that these coatings have found uh, use in, um, everything from large civil infrastructure, such as the stadium you see here pictured in the top left, that's AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. Um, you've got, um, even more recently, the brand new U.S. Bank Stadium up in Minneapolis. Um, actually used a direct-to-metal version of this technology for all the interior structural steel. You've got things like pipeline, exterior pipelines that have been used in the oil and gas industry, exterior of rail cars. You've got storage tanks, exterior of wind turbine towers, and of course, the ex uh, protection of steel bridges. So these coatings have a number of different application and fiscal property advantages. So those of you that are familiar with standard polyureas, you typically think very fast to dry, require very sophisticated equipment, plural component application. Polyaspartic coatings are quite different from that regard. In here you can actually get the fast cure where you're getting dry to handle times of maybe an hour or two, but you're able to get a usable pot life of two to three hours. So they can be applied by standard single component airless equipment and then spray and brush roll applied in small areas, mostly for touch up. So what really allows that unique balance between long usable pot life and short dry time is actually within the chemistry of the resin itself. So with that reaction between the A component and the B component, water actually acts as a catalyst, which is actually quite unique. So what that means is when a contractor mixes up a five gallon bucket of material, it's not really exposed to much moisture, right? Only the surface area of that five gallon bucket is really where the, the moisture is being, uh, being uh, absorbed in the coating. Now, as soon as that coating is applied to the structure, now you vastly exponentially increase that surface area that the coating is being exposed to moisture, moisture. It's then absorbed into the coating and basically kicks off that reaction and you get that very fast cure response. On the physical property side, you know, these materials, the polyaspartics, have very similar color and gloss retention as traditional industrial maintenance grade polyurethanes, those that you would find being used on steel bridges today. However, they have excellent edge retention, in many cases greater than that of a traditional polyurethane. So what that really does is you're getting more film thickness on the edge where you're going to see corrosion break down first. And from the corrosion resistance standpoint, these type of products can be used in direct to metal applications more for moderately uh, corrosive environments and then can also be applied over zinc rich primers for more of that heavy duty protection which you might uh, need on a steel bridge. So then the question becomes does less coats, does this stuff really work? Well, the first, the first thing we always look at is accelerated testing data, right? So there's been a number of third parties that have gone through and actually validated this concept of moving from three coats to two without having to sacrifice performance. So I'm assuming most of you in the room are very familiar with the NetPEP program. These systems have been submitted several different times. You've got AFA, the Federal Highway themselves have published a number of studies that have validated the performance, along with some of our colleagues to the north with uh, the Alberta uh, Ministry of Transportation and their cooperative paint testing program. They've also validated this concept of three to two coats. So just real briefly looking at some of the test data. So the FHWA study looked at three different standard two-coat systems, one based on all polyurethane, another more conventional epoxy, zinc, epoxy, and uh, urethane, and then an inorganic zinc system. And they did an uh, accelerated uh, testing program, 5,000 hours basically, in modified cyclic cohesion testing, but also incorporated a free cycle. And after that 5,000 hours, they had an average scribe creep of about two millimeters. And the variety of different two-co systems had an average of about 2.3 millimeters. So both of them performed very well. They also looked at uh, some, two, uh, some natural weathering in Seattle City, New Jersey. And again, very comparable performance between the three-coat and the two-coat systems. So as I mentioned, also the, the cooperative paint testing program also did a similar study looking at three coat systems and two coat systems. Here just pulling a few of out of the study, you can see again looking at scribe creep after 3,000 hours of accelerated testing, 
very similar performance in scribe creep. And then lastly here, looking at the, uh, the data pulled out of the Net NetPep data mine of the most recent submission, which was back in 2014, you see an uh, epoxy zinc rich primer with a, an aspartic top coat. And looking at the performance data versus uh, the NEP coat criteria for organic zinc rich based systems as far as acceptance, you can see in all cases, whether it's from the blistering or average or max scribe creep, the system performed actually quite exceptionally well against the performance criteria. So what does all this mean for bridge owners? Well, the old adage that time is money certainly reigns true here. So by reducing the number of layers from three to two, there's significant savings in labor reduction in um, both maintenance painting, but also in new construction as well. And that cost savings really comes through less labor. So you think about now you have the applicator putting on less less, one less layer of paint. So all those related painting operations, you do one less time, whether it's mixing, waste disposal, uh, coating inspection, QA, QC processes. But for maintenance painting, now you've got less mobilization of equipment. You've got less traffic, maintenance of traffic. You've got um, uh, maybe less time you might have to run dehumidification or heating equipment. So by being able to do this much faster, you have much less labor that goes into the whole painting process. So one of the earliest documented cases of using this, these polyaspartic tuco systems for bridge maintenance painting was actually done up in Connecticut. And this was a study published by Brian Kassler when he worked for the Connecticut Department of Transportation. And they originally did uh, Bridge 1186, which is Interstate I-84 over Star Avenue, just outside of Danbury, Connecticut. And the, the, the job went so well that the contractor who had a bridge just, just down the road asked to also use the TUCO system on that job. And what the Connecticut DOT did was actually had them then for that second project track as much as the contractor could, every single operation to complete that process of applying the TUCO system and also do the same when he painted the other half of the bridge with a three coat system. And at the end of the day, they could calculate back out what the cost savings and the, the improvement was to the throughput of the project. So here's some pictures taken uh, recently uh, last year. We can see here on the left of the initial structure done after 15 years, excellent performance, less than a tenth of a percent rusting across the entire structure. On the right, um, not, not holding up quite as well, but still doing pretty well for 15 years of service. So looking at the cost structure breakdown between the, the, the three coat and the two coat system on that second structure, they were basically doing the paying about $22 per square foot for complete removal and reapplication of the three coat system. If you look down here in, this, uh, in the chart here, there is a cost increase for the um, top coat material in, in, uh, in conjunction to or in comparison to the polyurethane. But where you're seeing savings is you don't apply the epoxy, you don't have you have some le less time labor for inspection, um, less time mobilizing uh, equipment and rigging, but the big saving comes from traffic management. So at the end of the day, direct cost to the DOT was actually 20% less, pretty significant savings. So now I'll hand this over to Mark and he'll talk about what's happening in Virginia. I just gotta say, I'm thrilled to be here because it was 25 degrees when I left Pittsburgh this morning. So uh, this is a nice change. Uh, I'm gonna run you through this Virginia case study or, or projects that we did with the polyaspartic two-coat system. So in 2005, Virginia completed one of the first polyaspartic projects um, that had been done for a state DOT. And after 10 years of service, 37 of these bridges were inspected and visited by Aaron and myself and Wayne Fleming from the Virginia Department of Transportation. 15 of the structures were the polyaspartic urethane, and 22 were moisture-cured urethane, uh, three-coat moisture-cured urethane system applied to the bridges, the three-coat system consisting of a moisture-cured urethane zinc-rich primer, intermediate coat, and top coat. We used a uh, field rating system based on SSPC Viz 1, where we rated the bridges from very poor to very good, uh, based on the uh, degree of rusting, uh, that we could see on the bridges uh, anywhere from less than or equal to 0.03% all the way up to greater than 10%. We focused on three areas of the bridges, naturally each beam end and the mid-span of the structures. So of the bridges, 24 of them uh, had concrete decks, 
Uh, 22 of those were simple spans, two were cantilevers with suspended spans, and we also visited two truss bridges. We also looked at some bridges uh, with timber decks, and uh, naturally some of those had, had less performance uh, from either system because of the leaking of road salts and things like that through, a, through an open timber deck kind of structure. So the bridges with concrete decks, um, you can see here in this chart, uh, four of the moisture-cured urethane bridges were rated as, as being very good after the time period. Twelve of them were rated as good. On the polyaspartic, we had four that were very good, three that were good, and one that was fair. Naturally, bridges with concrete decks where there was cracks in the deck, there was more corrosion down on the steel, and these bridges are located in areas of Virginia where they use quite a bit of de-icing salts out in western Virginia in the mountains and uh, they get exposed to uh, quite a bit of, of, of airborne contaminants and whatnot. They were in rural areas, they were in urban areas, it was a pretty wide variety of environments that these structures were in. So this is bridge 1085 which we rated very good. This is a three coat moisture cured urethane system. And bridge 1110, as you can see, also in good condition, also a three-coat moisture-cured urethane system. On the polyaspartics, bridge 6038, this is a two-coat polyaspartic system consisting of an organic zinc-rich epoxy uh, and the polyaspartic top coat. And these structures were rated very good. And in 2058 was in good condition. Um, with just, a, I think in this particular one, and we've got other pictures of these where there was just maybe a little bit of edge corrosion uh, in some areas where we, we assumed that the contractor was maybe a little light on the organic zinc epoxy primer. In the truss bridge structures, um, the polyaspartic bridge was rated good, the moisture cured urethane bridge was rated fair. We only uh, really were able to get to these structures from, from the deck up was all we rated. We didn't have access to down underneath them. Uh, this is the three coat truss bridge that we rated in fair condition. A little bit of corrosion around some plates and things like that. And this was the polyaspartic two coat truss bridge. Um, this area that you see down in here it's not really corrosion or anything going on. It's debris from floodwaters that came up and over the top of this structure and collected a lot of dirt down in there. So summarizing the ratings, um, four of the moisture cured urethane bridges were in very good condition, 12 were in good shape. The polyaspartic, four were very good, three were good, one was fair. And when we get to the truss bridges, the polyaspartic urethane was good and the MCU was in fair condition. Recently, there have been a couple other projects that we, we wanted to highlight that have been done by other DOTs. Uh, this project is a Michigan DOT project completed in 2017. It's west, west road over I-75 in Woodhaven, Michigan. Uh, as you can see, it was done in 2017, so it's still performing very well, and we're continuing to evaluate this one. Up in Portland, Maine, uh, there were four structures done. I think it's the I-295 around Portland, Maine, uh, where these overpasses were completed. This was an interesting project because it was actually scheduled to have been done starting in the spring, and because of some delays and whatnot, contractor never got up there till late summer, early fall. And just in case you're not familiar with Portland, Maine, late summer is August and fall ends about the 1st of October. And he got these structures done and, and the comments we had from the main DOT on these four structures was if they had been done with a traditional three coat system, the project would have had to have stretched on into the next painting season. They'd have never got it done that year. This is the most recent one. Uh, this was a project done for the Maryland State Highway Administration. Completed in 2017, it's uh, 648 over Maryland 10, which is a very busy, well-salted, heavy traffic area uh, bridge structure. The interesting thing about um, the product used on this one, uh, Maryland has recently 
instituted lower volatile organic compound regulations for field applied coatings. So this project was done with a bit of a tweaked formula on our polyaspartic to get down within the new VOC regulations that are creeping into some of the states in the Northeast. It's kind of a third generation, if you will, of this particular product offering. So polyaspartic systems can offer significant cost savings in maintenance painting without sacrificing performance. And more than a half a dozen states have completed projects as of, as of now with these polyaspartic coatings. Are there any questions? And if they're of a chemical nature, he gets them. What would you overcoat it with if you wanted to go back in spot coat? Can you reapply the polyaspartic system? Yes. I mean, there is. As with, as with any urethane, polyaspartic or otherwise, you're well beyond the critical reco window of the product. So there is some surface preparation that needs to be done. Generally, a light abrasion of where you'd be overlapping onto intact coatings. Um, do you recommend striping the primer, the polyspartic, or both? Generally, we're striping the primer. Not striping? Not, not generally, we're not striping the top coat because of the good edge retentive qualities you get with it. It's not really necessary. I mentioned earlier that the traffic management was one of the biggest areas of savings. Did you guys include the cost in, what is traffic management? Is that just the MOT? Can you give, elaborate a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm going to say it's just the MOT, but to be honest with you, Paul, I don't know what all the, that we, that we, especially what went into Brian's study. All right. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.